Good day, this is Dr. Murphy with the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Kentucky, and this is the first of two podcasts um, covering the basic management of perioperative pacemakers, ICDs, and the principles of defibrillation. The content for these podcasts comes from the um, December 2015 content outline, which has uh, no significant changes from previous editions and the topics include defibrillators, various types of cardiac pacing including biventricular synchronized pacing, there is a standard nomenclature which we will cover in this podcast. In addition you should study perioperative dysrhythmias which will be the topic of a different podcast and or PBLD. And you should study the perioperative implications of pacemakers and AICDs, also known as CIEDs or cardiac implantable electronic devices. Ventricular synchronization appears a second time in this outline, so it must be important. You will need to self-study about cardiac ablation therapy and maze surgery not covered in this podcast. For ablations, cryotherapy, and maze procedure, I suggest you review the PowerPoint by Dr. Peter Jessel from Oregon Health and Science University, which is linked to this podcast on our wiki. Another resource is a 2012 refresher course lecture by Dr. Mahajan at UCLA, which will also be linked to, to this podcast. After reviewing those two references, you will have a much better idea about anesthesia for cardiac electrophysiology procedures. Regarding May's procedure, I will direct you to a brief overview of surgery for atrial fibrillation by Dr. James Cox. The Cox Maze procedure has ultimately evolved into the Cox Maze 4, and now there are totally thoracoscopic maze procedures. Anesthesia for bilateral VATS procedures and maze procedures, such as performed by Dr. Ted Wright here at UK, can also be very challenging, and I will post an, an article on this topic. The learning objectives of this podcast, or this pair of podcasts, are for you to become aware of ASA practice advisories uh, on CIEDs, to develop a preoperative CIED management protocol for your practice, to explain safe intraoperative management of patients with CIEDs to perioperative personnel, to formulate a plan for safe postoperative management of patients with CIEDs, and to discuss the benefits of cardiac resynchronization therapy. This is one of the primary references as suggested by Dr. Shell for this series and you can access it online. There are also fairly recent practice advisories on this topic and this is the front page of one from the American Society of Anesthesiologists. Prior to the 2011 practice advisory, there was a practice advisory published in 2005. And you should review the uh, 2011 practice advisory, although I will make reference to it. In addition, the seventh edition of Miller's Anesthesia, Chapter 43, which is quite easily accessible to you, has 10 preoperative key points. Whether or not you get very much cooperation from cardiology, the vendor of the CIED, or your hospital, these are the recommendations for cardiac implantable electronic devices. Product specific rep recommendations can actually be quite detailed and your best resource may be the vendor. In addition, there are a few 
key points for the intraoperative and postoperative periods. I particularly like the advice to limit the periods of asystole. Patients with disabled defibrillation function must be monitored until that function is restored. The issue of reinterrogation after surgery is a logistical one, and surprisingly, or not surprisingly, I should say, vendors who believe that their CIED is immune to interference or inadvertent reprogramming will tell you that inter interrogation after surgery is not necessary. This is a 2013 review on the uh, topic, also authored or co-authored by Dr. Mark Rosner. And in it, the key points are that there should be a systems-based approach to care. Before elective surgery, the CIED should be interrogated. If EMI is likely, the anti-tachycardic function should be disabled and defibrillator pads should be applied. The magnet behavior of the CIED should be known. There should be continuous cardiac monitoring until the ICD is turned back on or reactivated. There should be documentation of interrogation and programming. And the final key point is that postoperatively, CIEDs often require reinterrogation after surgery. This is a practice guideline from the cardiology literature. A quick search of this document for the word anesthesia finds no hits. These guidelines are for cardiologists. You can use them as a resource, but they do not advise uh, perioperative management of these devices. However, the management of these devices in the perioperative period has been written about in the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation newsletter. And this is the fall 2013 issue and therefore includes the uh, recommendations of the 2011 practice advisory. This slide lists the essential information to be communicated to the perioperative team by the CIED specialty team. This assumes that your hospital or uh, pre-op clinic has a functional uh, CIED specialty team. In many anesthesiologists eyes, number 11 is the uh, most important one and the question of uh, Uh, pacemaker dependency appears to mean different things to different people. The report that a pacemaker, that a patient is dependent on the pacemaker when it has been set to a rate of 70 does not necessarily mean that the patient is dependent on it. This is another uh, screenshot from this newsletter and the box outlined in red may be as important as anything else in the newsletter and refers to uh, the institution having a team. If the institution does not have a team, the editors uh, suggest that the anesthesia providers should rely on the communication with available cardiologists, surgeons, and vendors. And now for something completely different. Cardiac resynchronization.
those cardiology guidelines do have recommendations for cardiac resynchronization. And since it figured fairly prominently in our content outline, I will spend a few minutes discussing it. Cardiac resynchronization is a topic which has been covered in the anesthesiology literature. This is an AP chest radiograph of a patient with a biventricular pacing device. And as you can see, in addition to the generator, the CAN, there are three pacing leads located in the right atrium, the coronary sinus, and the right ventricle. So it's not too complicated. And uh, this photograph comes from a uh, review article or chapter uh, in a book edited by Dr. Fleischer in the Evidence-Based Practice of Anesthesiology. And if you take the time to carefully read the uh, details of this slide, um, you will get an appreciation for the complexity of this uh, kind of pacing. Nonetheless, it does appear to be a successful strategy for improving the function of the failing ventricle in some patients. And the next two slides show that cardiac resynchronization therapy can successfully reduce left ventricular volume. So in summary, cardiac resynchronization therapy is felt to be a valuable modality that allows optimization of ventricular function in patients with heart failure and electrical conduction delays. And the uh, benefits of resynchronization therapy are felt to be well established. And improved understanding of these devices and the principles behind the therapy will aid practitioners in caring for patients with heart failure. And this should include anesthesiologists in this day and age. The next three slides are from uh, 2016, and it is still purported that CIEDs improve the quality of life in heart failure and that CRT can reverse the pathologic remodeling of the left ventricle. Here's an algorithm for CIED or CRT uh, use in heart failure. I am uh, particularly impressed by the uh, phrase heart replacement therapy, which is in the lower left corner. In summary, this article from this year does conclude that much work still needs to be done on exploring the benefits of individualized programming and understanding the interactions of these devices in this expanding cohort of patients. Moving along into Canada, the Canadian Journal of Anesthesiologists has published its society position statement on uh, the uh, perioperative management of patients with these devices and others. They are not quite as detailed as the ASA uh, practice advisory, 
but does uh, recommend uh, that planning for perioperative device management should be performed and it should be a collaborative uh, process. While they're not as, as uh, extensive or as detailed as the ASA, they do have some practical recommendations and they do um, recommend close clinical monitoring. One component of the uh, Canadian Society position statement is somewhat unique in that it uh, spe uh, refers specifically to the argon beam coagulator with essentially the same warnings and advice as ordinary electrosurgical devices. So in addition to the Canadian guidelines and the American Practice Advisor, there are European guidelines. For what it's worth, a worldwide trial found no MRI related complications. And further, for your interest, this is the European algorithm for CIEDs, which is a lot more liberal than um, our local practice. This set of guidelines from Europe has the unfortunate history of having been authored by a discredited researcher. And therefore probably carries very little weight any longer. So what are the key points of this podcast? Well, first, CIED is a relatively new acronym and stands for Cardiac Implantable Electronic Device. Preoperative evaluation, the questions to ask include, does the patient have a CIED? Not every uh, device which is implanted in the uh, delta pectoral area is a cardiac device. So therefore any focus history, physical, chest x-ray and electrocardiogram are required. Each one of these will give you important information including the symptoms that the patient had requiring the device, the location of the device, the number of leads and a clue as to what kind of device it is and perhaps the function of the pacemaker or device. So if yes, and the patient does have a CIED, the next questions and key points are what kind of device? What does the manufacturer's card say? Is there any information in databases and, ca and or can you consult with a cardiologist or the referring cardiologist? If there is a device, you need to determine whether or not the patient is dependent on it. This may require a programmer, which will allow you to reduce the rate until spontaneous cardiac activity becomes evident, although it is possible to diagnose pacemaker dependence or the likely dependence by history. And this slide lists um, 
the uh, a verbal history of bradyarrhythmia or the history of successful AV nodal ablation requiring a CIED as being evidence of dependence on a CID, CIED. Next in the preoperative preparation, a key point is, will electromagnetic interference occur during the procedure? This includes electrocautery, radiofrequency ablation, MRI, and presumably argon beam coagulation. If yes, it is recommended that the pacing function of the CIED should be changed to an asynchronous pacing mode. If an, a, if an ICD is disabled with unchanged pacing function, the representative of the uh, manufacturer may recommend a magnet. This is at odds with ASA recommendations. If the pacer is not inhibited, presumably it would be safe to keep it in DDD mode. However, if it is inhibited and the underlying rhythm is inadequate, then reprogramming should have been done. Typically, an AICD with a magnet applied continues with unchanged pacemaker function. So, placing a, pace, placing a magnet on the uh, device may only disable the defibrillation um, function. However, the actual practice advisory states that the consultants and Heart Rhythm Society members are less likely to agree with reprogramming to an asynchronous mode. However, the ASA practice advisory and the exp and experts are quite clear on the recommendations, which is to program the, ASIC, the device to asynchronous mode, perhaps at a higher rate. So, preoperative preparation, the ICD antitachyrhythmic function should be suspended. When that occurs, temporary pacing and defibrillation equipment should be immediately available before, during, and after a surgical procedure. Consultation with a cardiologist or a pacemaker ICD service may be necessary. For all CIEDs, consider advising the individual performing the procedure to use bipolar or ultrasonic scalpel. The purpose of this slide is to reinforce the uh, knowledge that not all pacemakers are converted to an asynchronous mode with magnet placement. And the task force recommends against the routine use of a magnet over an ICD. And this is because not all pacemakers convert to an asynchronous mode with magnet placement. To amplify and reiterate, this paragraph comes from Miller's 7th edition, and again, this is um, being stated because not all pacemakers convert to asynchronous mode with mega placement. And obviously, lack of backup pacing is a uh, serious um, failure. The intraoperative management. Primarily, we're monitoring the CIED and its function or non-function or malfunction, as well as the patient. We are trying to prevent potential CIED malfunction. We are there to perform emergency defibrillation, cardioversion, or heart rate support. As part of this um, effort, our monitoring of the pulse can include an arterial line or a pulse examiner or perhaps something as simple as a finger on the pulse.
all these recommendations apply to general anesthesia, regional anesthesia, and monitored anesthesia care. Most importantly, if an unanticipated device interaction is found, you may have to consider discontinuation of the procedure until the source of interference can be eliminated, eliminated or managed. This is most important. Fortunately for us, the task force believes that the anesthetic technique does not influence CID function, so therefore you have carte blanche to provide the anesthetic technique of your choice. To reiterate, the uh, guidelines regarding MRI in the United States. American guidelines recommend against MRI in patients with CIEDs except under extreme circumstances. For what it's worth, the majority of consultants, ASA members, and, H and Heart Rhythm Society members generally agree that MRI is contraindicated in all CID patients. Although, if you look at the uh, Heart Rhythm Society um, members, uh, it's nearly a 50-50 split. Managing electromagnetic interference. The cautery tool and current return pad should be positioned to avoid current passing through the CID. However, there's insufficient literature to support this statement. They use, uh, using short intermittent uh, and irregular bursts at the lowest feasible energy levels is recommended. Using bipolar electrocautery or elect ultrasonic scalpel harmonic systems is also recommended. Now I prefer, I, I presume this refers to cardiac ablation procedures. And if it is in reference to cardiac ablations, you should at least have an electrophysiologist present. So, however, other uh, uses of radio frequency ab uh, for ablation could be uh, interpreted to m mean that uh, you should discuss any concerns regarding the proximity of the ablation catheter to the CIED leads. In other words, if you were above the umbilicus, perhaps uh, there could be some uh, stray radio frequency energy that could be carried to the uh, leads attached to the cardiac device. Now, it is stated that radiation therapy is safe if it's outside the field of radiation. And for some reason, the topic of runaway pacemaker is mentioned here. Moving on to patients undergoing ECT. ECT can be administered to CIED patients without significant damage to the disabled CIED. No problem here, except that the CIED is disabled, which doesn't sound good to me. But I would be a little worried about the disabled CIED. So, overall, patients with CIEDs who are undergoing 
ECT require a plan and um, it could possibly even require a um, temporary pacemaker. The CIED may need to be placed in an asynchronous mode to avoid myopotential inhibition. Now as far as emergency defibrillation or cardioversion is concerned, first eliminate the EMI. Second, you may consider removing the magnet to enable the antitachycardic therapies. Third, you could reprogram the ICD, although if it's an emergency, it may be most appropriate to proceed with emergency external defibrillation or cardioversion. For intraoperative management of um, ventricular fibrillation or the need for cardioversion for atrial fibrillation, you should follow the ACLS guidelines for energy level and paddle placement. Postoperatively, primarily this is the interrogation and restoring of CIED functions. The cardiac rate and rhythm must be monitored continuously postoperatively. It should be interrogated and if the settings are inappropriate then it should be reprogrammed. For an ICD, the antitachycardic therapies should be restored. And all other settings of the CID should be um, checked to be appropriate. ICDs are CIDs per the 2011 practice advisory. Therefore, the recommendations are generalized for all CIEDs and specific for ICDs where emergency defibrillation or cardioversion are concerned. Magnets are a potential problem, and often we have no idea what is recommended for a given CIED. To be brief, the behavior of an ICD after application of a magnet is variable. Most devices will suspend the tachydysrhythmia detection and therefore therapy, however. In general, magnets will not affect the ICD antibradycardic pacing mode. And finally, at the end of this podcast, I'm summarizing the, uh, the advice of the expert, Dr. Mark Rosner, uh, that no special monitoring is required because of the ICD per se. ECG monitoring and emergency cardioversion and defibrillation must be available. It is his opinion and the uh, recommendation of the ASA uh, practice advisory that every ICD should undergo preoperative interrogation and that postoperatively the ICD must be reinterrogated and re-enabled because deaths from failure to re-enable ICDs have been reported. This is the end of the first podcast. Thank you very much.